All right, welcome to this first lecture on uh, the potential energy surface and now its relationship to the basic force field and molecular mechanics. So the last time that uh, we had a lecture online, uh, I suggested that there were some fundamental points about the potential energy surface that uh, were worth considering. One was that obviously the potential energy surface was a useful concept, but in general, how might one go about constructing it in order to survey uh, the stationary points of interest and understand their relationship one to another? Of course, for an arbitrary system, uh, the potential energy surface is defined by a molecular formula. And I also noted, this is a little bit of a review from the last video, that when it comes to understanding equilibria and rate constants, we don't really need to know the whole potential energy surface, which is really quite vast. It's typically a very high dimensionality. What we really want are critical points, minima and saddle points, and their relationship one to another. And so if we could find those uh, as a priority regions of the potential energy surface, as opposed to having to have the entire surface, that also might be uh, relatively helpful and, and efficient. But on the other hand, if we don't do the whole surface, how can we know the, uh, where all the critical points are? Uh, that is, in the absence of seeing everything, how do you know you found all the things that you want? And I gave you some insight into how experimentalists go about defining regions of a potential energy surface. And so, for example, for a bond stretching coordinate, that would be movement along one internal coordinate dimension, you can use information from infrared spectroscopy in order to assign energy levels. And it turns out through uh, use of the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation for, uh, for vibration, you can, from those levels, determine the shape of the potential energy curve. And that's how a, an experimentalist would get that, that one dimension. And again, this is review. I'll just uh, show it one more time to cement it in your memory. So a typical IR measurement would, for instance, take you from the zeroth vibrational level to the first vibrational level. And that separation in energy is dependent on the reduced mass of the system, as well as on the shape of the potential energy that would go into the Schrodinger equation. You'll remember the Schrodinger equation expands a Hamiltonian in kinetic energy and potential energy. The kinetic energy comes from the vibration itself, and the reduced mass plays a role. And the potential energy is this curve that would fit in here. And so once you know the energy separation, you know the reduced mass, you can actually map out the curve. Of course, to get larger and larger uh, sections or distances, whatever we want to call it, to map out the entire curve, it's helpful to have lots of energy levels to refine possibilities. And so you might do isotopomers, which will have different uh, levels because of different reduced masses. You can look at overtones in order to reach higher energy levels, which will tell you more about what's going on further out from the equilibrium structure. Uh, you can look at hot bands, you can survey lots and lots of overtones, you can look at emission spectra, so here's a photon coming out instead of one being absorbed. And in any case, when you're all done, you can fit by uh, doing calculations, essentially, of the Schrodinger equation that will give you back these energy levels given a particular functional form V. Okay, so uh, let's think about that for a second. So I've, I've kind of emphasized that uh, this is a fitting exercise. So you would take the Schrodinger equation, h equals t plus v, and you're going to uh, plug in an arbitrary v and solve the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation to get energy levels. So this isn't a quantum mechanics course. I'll, I'll let you go back and look at your elementary quantum mechanics for how to solve a Schrodinger equation. But suffice it to say, the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation can be solved relatively straightforwardly. And uh, the v that you choose to plug in is going to have to be uh, represented in some mathematical form. So t is pretty easy. If you recall, it involves a del squared operator. But what about v? Well, you know, it's math. So you're going to have to express energy, this axis, as a function of r, a, b. And so what functional form might prove useful well, a fairly straightforward approach would be a polynomial function. So polynomials are, are quite handy. Algebra certainly takes advantage of polynomials extensively. And what we might imagine doing is taking a point on the curve that we probably know the most about. 
And we know the most about it because so many of the systems have values of RAB, so this is a diatomic, a molecule AB if you like. Uh, at least at relatively low temperatures, like room temperature, you will typically be in low energy regions and your molecules will have bond distances on the order of the equilibrium bond distance. So we could imagine expanding in a polynomial sense the curve about this region, REQ. And in particular, if we now assign the zero of energy as being at the bottom of this well here, we're going to have that the energy, I'll use U to represent energy, as a function of the distance R, so that's the bond distance between atoms A and B, is equal to zero, so that's the point we're expanding about, plus some coefficient times the uh, linear, so this is a term that's linear in the displacement, this is a term that's quadratic in the displacement, this is a term that's cubic in the displacement, and of course it's a polynomial function. I can take this out arbitrarily far, as many terms as I'd like to include. And you'll recall from sort of basic calculus that that uh, polynomial expansion, in fact, the, the rigorous way to, to fit any sort of curve, a one-dimensional curve in this case, is through a Taylor expansion. And so in the Taylor expansion, you also expand a function, so here's our energy function again, as a value at a particular point, so u at the equilibrium point, plus the first derivative of the function with respect to the variable evaluated at the point about which you're expanding times the linear displacement, plus 1 over 2 factorial, the second derivative also evaluated at the expansion point times the quadratic displacement, and so on, 1 over 3 factorial, third derivative, etc., etc. And so this is rigorously correct when expanded out infinitely far, and typically we use Taylor expansions because we truncate them at some point as a, a worthwhile approximation. And so, uh, as we've already uh, seen, well, we haven't already seen this, I suppose, but uh, let's think about these terms individually. Well, this first derivative term, du dr, is actually equal to zero, and that's because we're expanding about a critical point, right? This is the minimum on the curve, and so the slope of the curve at that point is zero. And then uh, the second term, the second derivative of the potential energy with respect to the uh, bond distance, that actually defines the bond force constant. So when you do the uh, harmonic oscillator equation in quantum mechanics, it is this second derivative that appears in a quadratic expansion. And so if you were to truncate the Taylor expansion at this point, this would be the force constant for a spring. You'd get that the energy is equal to some reference value, this term is zero, plus one over two, k r minus r e q squared. So if you remember, that's Hooke's law for a spring, that the energy goes up quadratically and the, the softness or hardness of the spring is related to the spring force constant, k, and so that's a harmonic oscillator if we uh, truncate at that point. So some uh, things that are worth thinking about along these lines are that was a single dimension. That was for a, a bond stretching or contracting. So could a potential energy surface of arbitrarily high dimensionality, so now not just one coordinate, but all coordinates, could it be constructed as a sum of either independent or coupled analytic equations? So if we were to take a truncated Taylor expansion, that's an analytic equation. All I have to do is plug in a distance, an equilibrium distance, and a force constant, and I will be able to compute an energy. Uh, so the variable in that case is the distance. When, it, when we talk about independent or coupled analytic equations, you could have every dimension having its own analytic equation, or you could have certain equations that might involve more than one variable simultaneously. But in any case, this is a curve-fitting exercise, except instead of being a one-dimensional curve, it is a potentially very high-dimensional surface that you'd like to express with analytic equations. Uh, if I choose to do that, a, a question I should be thinking about are what are the best coordinates I might use for that potential energy surface? And it, it does seem as though one of the things you'd probably like to do would be to have as many independent terms as possible, where I'm not worrying about sort of cross terms between uh, different coordinates, because that, well, it just may lead to certain mathematical complications.
Of course, once I choose a coordinate system in which to express my potential energy surface, that may be related to how I'm describing a molecular geometry, and if that's not clear, we'll have a little more to say about that later on. But these two concepts are clearly tied one to another. And in terms of the actual analytic functional forms, I, we just looked at a polynomial form for a, a bond stretching coordinate, but there's no reason to think that that's the only possible form. Certainly a huge amount of curve fitting is done in applied math, if you will, through Fourier expansions. So those are expansions of sine waves or cosine waves in order to fit uh, periodic curves. One could use exponential functions. One could use, you know, pick your favorite function. There are all sorts of interesting uh, functions that are out there and can be used as analytic approximants to arbitrary curves. And again, our, our goal is probably in order, is in order to be efficient, we want to pick these forms uh, for that purpose. Well, and, and before thinking about the math, let me come back to being a chemist and ask people to think uh, like chemists. And in particular, I'm going to go back to physical organic chemistry, which has some, some reasonably mature concepts that arose throughout the course of the 20th century that are relevant in thinking about potential energy surfaces. And indeed, molecular mechanics was really first invented, if you will, by physical organic chemists who were thinking about conformational analysis for the most part. And so uh, when discussing conformational analysis, you'll often hear discussed the concept of strain. And so strain, if you will, is a phenomenon that's associated with particular aspects of a molecular geometry not being ideal. That is, the overall bonding in a molecule constrains in some way certain subsets of the atoms to have positions relative to one another that they're just not all that happy about. So one can imagine that a particular bond or angle or torsion, what have you, has an ideal value, but perhaps because of substituents or ring closures or any sort of constraint on the system, uh, a molecule may not be able to adopt that ideal value. It's displaced somehow from that value, and that introduces strain. And so a good example, and indeed one of the very first ones for which molecular mechanics uh, was, to which it was applied, is biphenyl. So if you think about biphenyl, that's two benzene rings connected by a bond, one to the other. Nominally, we would expect uh, two aromatic rings to want to be coplanar. They'd enjoy some nice pi overlap, and uh, that would be just fine. However, the orthohydrogens on each of the two benzene rings, if you were to flatten them and lay them down on a table, think about it that way, the orthohydrogens bump into each other. There is a steric clash. And as a result, biphenyl, in fact, rotates somewhat about the bond connecting the two phenyl rings. And there's about a 25, 30 degree torsion associated with that. The strain of the hydrogen-hydrogen non-bonded interaction displaces the torsion from what would otherwise be ideal. So that's, that's an example of strain, but there are many other ways that you might introduce strain. And so, as I've mentioned, there are these various flavors of strain, if you will. Uh, there is bond strain, so if I have very large substituents, say, on two carbon atoms that are bonded together with a single bond, perhaps that bond is a little longer than it would otherwise be if it were ideal. There's angle strain, and that same system I just named, really big substituents on, say, an ethane linkage might cause those substituents to bend away from one another and adopt bond angles at the, at the carbon atom, which are larger than might be ideal, and maybe the typical tetrahedral angle, 109.5, might be an ideal angle. Torsional strain I already mentioned for biphenyl, and those are just some examples of strain. Note also that the ideal values associated with bond lengths, angles, torsions, actually depend depend on more than only the atomic number. So, so far I've been invoking organic chemistry and I've mostly talked about carbon, but uh, let me pick two different atoms for the moment. Let me pick a carbon atom and an oxygen atom. Well, there's many ways you can have a carbon atom bonded to an oxygen atom. So in an ether, if you will, there is a single bond between a carbon and an oxygen. And if you were to look at the X-ray crystal structures for a huge number of ethers, 
you would find that that bond is about mm, 1.43 angstroms long in your average everyday run-of-the-mill ether. On the other hand, there's another way to uh, bond oxygen to carbon, and that is with a double bond. And so if you were to instead go and look at x-ray crystal structures for ketones, aldehydes, maybe uh, uh, carboxylic acids, but let's ignore that because there might be some resonance. In any case, you would, you'd find most CO double bonds are closer to about 1.23 angstroms, not 1.43 angstroms. So that's two different equilibrium distances, and probably we don't want to try to pick a functional form that has two different minima in it. You could certainly fit that with a polynomial, but it's not really realistic. In the ether, there's not a minimum at 1.23. There would actually be a lot of uh, repulsion between the carbon and the oxygen atom at that distance. Instead, what's, what's really true is that one may think of those as being just two different types of the same atom. There's an oxygen that's found in ether type, and there's an oxygen as found in uh, I guess we might call it sp2 compounds, sp2 oxygen compounds like ketones and aldehydes. And then finally one could go all the way to carbon monoxide which could nominally be described as having a bond order of three between carbon and oxygen. Of course that's not really a, an atom we need to worry about transferability. Carbon monoxide is pretty much the only molecule that has that kind of oxygen in it. But uh, that would have a still shorter bond associated with it and a different coordinate describing that. So uh, the ideal values that we're going to need in, say, a Taylor expansion that I illustrated for a bond stretch, they're going to be associated with the, the atom types. Each of those functional forms is going to be uh, specific to specific atom types. And so what is a force field then? Well, a force field is the collection of all of the atom types that you would like your force field to be defined for, the functions, the mathematical functions that are used for computing strain, so it could be a polynomial expansion, could be a Fourier expansion, we'll, we'll see more as we go along. I've, so far, I've, all I've illustrated is the polynomial. And finally, all of the constants that are needed in order to evaluate those, uh, those functions. And that really is the sort of thing that you would chisel into a stone tablet. So you would give your force field a name, typically, and that's actually quite critical. Uh, you know, for ease of scientific communication, you'd like a name to mean exactly one thing. So you might say, I am now going to create a force field, and I'm going to give it some name. I'll call it, oh, I don't know, MM6. That's my sixth version of a molecular mechanics force field. And MM6 has the following atom types, and there would be a long list of atom types. Maybe there would be sp3 carbon, sp2 carbon, sp carbon, aromatic carbon, carbocation carbon, you know, as many as you would like. And then for the full list of atom types, I might include all of the functions necessary to describe bonds between those atom types, angles between those atom types, uh, torsions between those atom types, and so on. And finally, also chiseled on my uh, stone tablet, so it's getting to be several stone tablets probably, all of the constants I'll need. Force constants for bond stretching, equilibrium distances, and we will shortly see some functions that have other constants as well. So uh, that's going to wrap up this particular video, but one thing I'd like you to think about before you look at the next one is, what are the implications of these, these uh, four bullet points? for a complete potential energy surface. And in fact, what I'd like you to think about conceptually is, I've mentioned that a, a generic potential energy surface is defined only by a uh, molecular formula. So for instance, I might have a molecule with formula C5H7NOS. But what, uh, what does taking the steps of the four bullet points above to define a force field do in terms of how we should start thinking about the potential energy surface? And uh, that's sort of an open question, but I'll, I'll just let you think about the implications for that. So how could you qualitatively describe the character of a complete potential energy surface? And I guess what I'd like you to think of is if you thought of it in terms of a landscape, and we all can think about landscapes. Hopefully all of you have been to mountains, even though now you're in Minnesota. Uh, so you think of kind of rugged possibilities. How would you characterize a truly complete potential energy surface? That is, all the possibilities of C5H7NOS.
and what are the implications of that characterization for force field development. All right, so we'll stop there, and we will pick up next time with uh, the next video in the series.